this this isn't an original paper. This is right, just this a, is a report. Yeah, this is a Science News article published this week. So in science, vaccine trials ramp up in children and adolescents. And let's see, there's um, there's a quote here, if memory serves. Here we go. Um, Adult deaths from COVID-19 dwarf those in children. In the United States, for example, young people make up about 250 of 500,000 total deaths. But for children, COVID-19 is still, quote, causing more deaths than influenza does in a typical season, says Douglas Dykema, a pediatrician and bioethicist at Seattle Children's Hospital. Quote, those are unnecessary deaths and should be prevented. So I, I found this uh, report a bit upsetting. Um, not only, mm -hmm. so first of all, to say it still causes more deaths than influenza in a given year, A, turns out to be questionable. So I've got that link. Yeah, yeah you want to yeah. show that? Um, so again, I just, I did not spend any time here. So I just, I went and looked at um, the CDC on influenza. And um, this is, oh boy. Uh, so in the 2019-2020 influenza season, there were 188 reported pediatric flu deaths. Um, and that was a fairly high year apparently, but you scroll down and you find that, um, again, you like, I, I was not ready for this. Um, oh, here we go. While any death in a child from a vaccine preventable illness is a tragedy, the number of pediatric flu deaths reported to CDC each season is likely an undercount. For example, even though the reported number of deaths during the 2017-18 flu season was 188, CDC estimates, and that turns out to be the same number, I think, this year, CDC estimates the actual number was closer to 600. It is likely the actual number of children who died from flu during the 2019-2020 season is higher as well. And I would say, and this is you know, based on no data, but that given the ways that COVID deaths have been counted, um, that... I think if there is an error in attributing deaths to COVID in children, it's the other way. It's an overcount. And the CDC is telling us that they think that deaths attributable to flu in children is reliably an undercount. And if those two, even if those things aren't true, those two numbers of deaths so far from COVID and deaths this last year from uh, flu in children are so close that you would at least need to do a statistical analysis. And um, you know this this claim from this pediatrician and bioethicist um, that it's it's higher higher deaths in COVID in children from COVID than from flu is suspect at best. And the idea that we are making policy based on this policy, which involves vaccinating children, is scary. Yeah, not only making policy, um, but doing so in um, in a way that has hidden hazards that aren't discussed here. So actually, Zach, would you put up the graph that I sent you? So this is also um, CDC in origin. This is 2019, 2018, 2019. And you can see there that the number of flu deaths in zero to four is at two. Is, oh. Can you read it? Yeah, it's 266. 266. And then, but then five to 17 is 211. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what the children demarcation is for COVID, but um, certainly it's over four. Right um, now, that, so that's that's a bigger number than we were seeing. Right now, go yeah. back to the uh, the report, the science news article. Yeah, the science mm -hmm. news article. Okay. Now, unfortunately, do you want Zach to show this? Yeah, you can uh -huh. show it and scroll up. Unfortunately, I can't see it there, but I believe that the uh, numbers here. So I saw, was it here? Oh, this is embarrassing. But they had a deaths um, in the zero to 20 range. And by saying zero to- Wait, Zero to 20 years old? Years old, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I can't find it there. But it creates a bias because effectively what we've got is evidence that very young children are pretty well protected and that the numbers are very low. Mm -hmm. What they're not saying here and what troubles me is that, okay, First of all, it's manipulative to say any, these deaths are preventable and any is too many, right? Yes. Coming out against the death yes. of children is, you know, not, uh, it, it is a position that everybody will uh, embrace and many will strongly do so on, the, on an emotional basis. No, but it, it, it at best pretends and at worst 
No, it at best doesn't understand and at worst pretends that trade-offs don't exist. Right, exactly. And so there is reason to keep children away from these vaccines that comes from the fact that they, by virtue of their age, are very well protected from catching yep. and tra and, uh, and apparently transmitting and transmitting yep. and suffering bad outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And they've got the most of their lives to live to experience what we hope are no, but might be long-term side effects of these new vaccines. That's exactly it. Not only do they have more of their lives ahead of them in which bad outcomes could emerge. Imagine outcomes that are delayed 30 or 40 years, right? If right. you're 50 and you get a vaccine that has a delayed bad outcome, right? You may not live to experience it or it may not compromise much of your life, but if you're young, yep. of course, um, yep. it will. But, um, but the other thing is developmental, right? The question is, what is the age at which it is most reasonable to start vaccinating, right? Now, you and I, mm -hmm. in dealing with vaccinations for our children, and we did fully vaccinate them, but we had a rubric, which was to delay each of the vaccinations as long as possible mm -hmm. so that we would get the full protection of those vaccines. There was no point in vaccinating kids against things that they weren't going to encounter. Mm -hmm. So we vaccinated them at the point that an encounter with the pathogen was likely. And we delayed we delayed travel. You know, the reason, um, part of the reason that I was doing study abroad alone for many years when I was just driven to do it and I wanted you to be part of it and our children to be part of it. And, you know, you really pushed back against it and said there, you know, yes, lots of people live in these places, but, you know, we're, we're not going to put our children in the situation where we have to choose between exposing them to diseases and vaccinating them earlier than, um, than we think they should be vaccinated. And right. so we didn't take them, for instance, to, you know, the uh, Ecuadorian Amazon until we felt that they were old enough to get the full, you know, yellow fever and all the rest of the vaccinations that they really, we felt they needed to have in order to be safe there. Right. So... Okay, we're going to vaccinate kids yeah. who are better protected, are more, are going to have, likely to have greater impacts, both because of the amount of time and because of the early stage in their development at which they're encountering these vaccines, which open up possibilities for bad outcomes that adults won't have. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, in that article, it describes the fact that because we have pretty good data from the uh, the safety trials that have already been done, these trials are being scaled back in terms of the number, right? So basically, this is being treated as pro forma, which is exactly the opposite of a responsible uh, approach to this. The yeah. responsible yeah. approach would say, kids have less to gain and more to lose. Mm -hmm. We should be very sure about the safety. Mm -hmm. And then we should figure out what the age is rather than clumping people zero to 20, That's crazy. right? Which is crazy because, you know, kids 18, 19 do have some substantial risk. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, the elephant in the room, of course, is the perverse incentive surrounding the profitability of vaccinating everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I increasingly think we, we have to worry about what role that is playing. Yeah. Uh, it does not make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody will explain to us why, uh, why we don't get it. But it doesn't make sense to me that all of the people who definitely had COVID, and I understand there's a problem with people who may have had COVID, right. but people who definitely had COVID, they've had the equivalent of a vaccine. And it's not obvious that this couldn't uh, uh, compromise immunity in ways that we discussed last time, mm -hmm. um, uh, or at the very least be needless and expose them to risks that we can't say much about because they could be very well delayed and we haven't seen the outcomes here. So uh, at the level of a desire to vaccinate everyone as if vaccination is inherently good and the more people we can get it to, the better, that does not uh, pay proper heed to the fact that the cost benefit analysis is very different depending upon who you are. Mm -hmm. And that means yeah. we should be hedging out those risks for several different groups of people. Exactly. And those, yeah, the, the three populations that I've mentioned multiple times are you, you've already mentioned two of them. It's children, it's people who've already had COVID and it's pregnant women. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah.